Hello, everybody. Um, when I was a teenager, I completely wasted my life, uh, like some teenagers do. Uh, I smoked pot on a daily basis, I dropped out of school, and uh, my mind sort of evaporated in a big cloud of wheat. And um, well, it was a horrible time, but I, I might even have was on the edge of a psychosis. I'm not sure about it. But, uh, but there was one good thing that came out of it, that was that it uh, turned out to be a, an endless source of inspiration for my own films. Uh, my films are all loosely based on that dark period in my life. And um, so is Junkyard, my, the latest film that I directed myself. And it's about two, grands, two friends growing up uh, in a messy drugs world. And that film that got noticed by uh, live action directors and uh, Hollywood studios, and um, I would like to, f and that got me into uh, bigger projects. And I would like to focus on one of them called Kurt Cobain Montage of Heck by Brad Morgan. Uh, but first, I would like to show you a, a trailer of my last film, Junkyard, to give an impression of the kind of animation that I do. Could the lights turn down? Okay, so this film was uh, pretty successful on film festivals and it uh, got noticed by uh, Disney and DreamWorks who invited me to give lectures for their artists. And um, when we decided to put it online for free, it got noticed by Brad Morgan who called me up and he told me that he was uh, already busy for five years making a film about Kurt Cobain, or Nirvana's frontman. And it was the first authorized uh, documentary about Kurt Cobain. So he had access to all the materials that were uh, part of the Kurt Cobain estate. So when he um, opened the vault, he found not only a lot of music and lyrics and things like that, but it also turned out that Kurt Cobain uh, was creative in all kinds of disciplines. So he made drawings and paintings and uh, collages and sculptures. And uh, so he found an animator called Stefan Nadelman to animate those things. But he also found two, um, two audio tapes, not two audios, a lot of audio tapes. And uh, he wanted to use the audio on those tapes, but he didn't have any visuals, so he needed animation for those. Yeah, when he saw my film, he sort of sensed the same kind of uh, dark energy and, and, and rawness that he found in the work of Kurt Cobain. So one of those tapes was this tape called Montage of Heck, which was a uh, sort of sound collage that uh, Kurt Cobain made, uh, kind of like uh, Revolution Number no. 9 by the Beatles. And there was another tape um, that was uh, Kurt recording uh, a story that he wrote when he was about 20, about his uh, teenage years, when he was smoking a lot of weed and hanging out with the wrong crowd and contemplating suicide and... Uh, trying to lose his virginity. So I heard the tape and I thought, hey, that sounds familiar. It sounds like a mix of all the films that I, that I already did. So I told Brett uh, that I said, yeah, it's going to be a piece of cake for me. Uh, but that was, of course, before we started. And, uh, and it turned to be a pretty tough ride uh, in the end. So the first thing we did was uh, Brett Morgan wrote uh, scripts for those excerpts, audio tapes. And I started storyboarding. And in animation, storyboarding is extremely important because you have to imagine with live action, you can record about 100 hours of film and then cut it back to two hours. But in animation, if it takes 20,000 drawings to make 80 minutes of film, so if you, make the, the, if you double that amount of drawings, it takes 12 years to make a film instead of six years. So you have to be, you have to edit and direct before you start animating, not, not to lose any time or finances. So, um, 
it took many months to go back and forth with, with the storyboards and make revisions and everything. And then um, I, everything was approved and the problem was I had only four months left to make all the animation. And that was a problem because Junkyard took me six years and I had four months left, so I didn't know how to deal with that. In, but what I did, I, I was so lucky that I could get a big team of excellent animators who, uh, who helped me through. Uh, most of them from the Netherlands, but also from Belgium, uh, Germany, and uh, Canada. And a producer that pulled me through, a Dutch producer. So then it became a very stressful time. I, I worked about 14 hours a day for four months without any days off. And uh, I would start at half past eight in the morning and then work until 11, drink a bottle of wine, go to sleep, and that's on and on for four months. It was pretty horrible. <laughs> So I, I want to show you some of the te techniques that we used. Um, this is for Junkyard, that's the same technique. I always make clay heads for all the characters that we use as reference for the animation for the heads because it's, those are very complicated forms. You cannot draw them completely by head from all sides, from all angles. So that's the first thing. Uh, then we animate uh, line drawings based on live action or reference material. And we use the clay heads on top of them as a reference for the animation. So this is the first stadium. Uh, the second stadium is when it's colored flatly, we put some digital lights on them. Then uh, the shadows are being painted. And for this film, for Junkyard, I did all the shadows myself out of financial reasons also. And it took me two years to do all the drawings for that film, which was extremely boring. But the good thing was it's so boring that I had enough space in my head to listen to hundreds of TED Talks, so I got really smart. <laughs> and in the last stadium, uh, all is being composited with my uh, background paintings that I make with oil paint on canvas, and it looks like this. When Brad Morgan approached me about uh, this film, he uh, was not intending to show Kurt Cobain as an animated character because he thought it wouldn't work. But I heard the audio tapes and I thought, well, this is going to be really hard. I really need uh, to show Kurt Cobain. So I started uh, sculpting a digital sculpture of his head based on photos that I found on the internet, which was really hard because he's a pretty boy, so he doesn't have any characteristics. And I based uh, drawings on top of that. Uh, and then I convinced him to, to make animation with Kurt Cobain in it. So the most characteristic thing about my uh, animation are the, uh, oh well, this is another thing, that we, we used uh, digital programs to light those models so the animators who made the shadows could use this as, a, as reference to see how the lights would uh, fall. Okay, so the main characteristics of my uh, <laughs> animation are my uh, paintings. I make all the background paintings with oil paint on canvas, uh, painted in a 17th century technique, and I do one every day. Um, I think that this was one of the reasons that Brad Morgan uh, liked my work, because it's all very or organic, it's uh, rough, and, um, and it's, yeah, it's uh, handmade, obviously. So these are other paintings that I did for uh, a documentary called Last Hijack. This one too. And these are paintings I did for uh, Richard Linklater in Los Angeles. They were meant for a film that got pulled off. And these are paintings I did for the Kurt Cobain film. Okay, so <coughs> I think the most important sequence that we did was um, the animation for a story that Kurt Cobain uh, recorded. I told you about it before. Um, the first time I heard it, it sounded like it, he made it up. He wrote it down and then he recorded it. And it was about him, uh, yeah, about his teenage years. And, um, but because we thought it was partly made up, we, uh, Brett chose to sort of show it a bit different from what, what he was telling. So for instance, if he says that he wanted to commit suicide and he lay on the tracks with, with a piece of cement on his chest, we would Visualize is a bit different. You will see it in a, in a minute. And um, so we don't know how true this story is, but the fact that he was already toying with the idea of suicide made it very tough because we 
everybody knows that he killed himself later on in his life and he left a two-year-old uh, child behind. I don't have the rights to, um, to show the whole segment, so I will show you uh, uh, a fragment of this scene. We got to the door and a very fat girl met us in. It wasn't obvious to me for over an hour that this girl seemed kind of quiet until one of the guys pointed out that she was in a special ed class. I'm sure a lot of kids would call her a, a retard and some just slow. And at the time and still to this day, I would call her quiet and illiterate, but not retarded. The object of the guys who had been going there for the past month was to steal booze from the downstairs basement den of her house. While others distracted her, one would go down and take a fifth and then exit out the downstairs. So we did this routine every other day and got away with it for only about a month. And during that month happened to be the epitome of my mental abuse from my mother. It turned out that pot didn't help me escape my troubles too well anymore and I was actually enjoying doing rebellious things like stealing booze and busting store windows. And nothing ever mattered. I decided within the next month I'll not sit on my roof and think about jumping, but I'll actually kill myself. And I wasn't going out of this world without actually knowing what it was like to get laid. So one day after school I went to the girl's house alone and invited myself in and she offered me some Twinkies. And I sat on her lap and I said, let's fuck. And I touched her tits and she went into her bedroom and got undressed in front of me. And I watched and realized that it was actually happening. So I tried to fuck her, but didn't know how, and asked her if she had ever done this before. And she said a lot of times, mainly with her cousin. I got grossed out very heavily with how her vagina smelled and her sweat reeked. So I left. My conscience grew to where I couldn't go to school for a week. And when I went back, I got in-house suspension for skipping. And that day, the girl's father came in screaming and accusing someone of taking advantage of his daughter. And so during lunch, the rumor started, and by the next day, everyone was waiting for me to yell and cuss and spit at me, calling me the retard fucker. I couldn't handle the ridicule, so I got high and drunk, and walked down to the train tracks, and laid down and put two big pieces of cement on my chest and legs, and I waited for the 11 o'clock train. And the train came closer and closer and closer, and it went on the next track besides me, and stood over me. The tension from school had an effect on me, and the train scared me enough to try to rehabilitate myself and my, my lifting weights and, and mathematics seemed to be improving, so I became less manically depressed, but still never had any friends because I, I hated everyone, for they were so phony. Okay, so when Brett called me for the first time, uh, before we started, I was kind of, I, I was in doubt if I would cooperate because I, I don't like this romanticizing of Kurt Cobain's uh, heroin use and I don't like the mythologizing of uh, self-destruction and this whole, you know, this drugs culture thing, Club of 27, I think it's a load of shit and uh, it shouldn't be promoted. And I told him that, and he said, well, I'm not going to promote his suicide or his drug uh, behavior, but I'm going to uh, sort of uh, mythology, no, well, not mythology, celebrate his life and his art. So when I saw the film in Sundance at the premiere, I was um, there in attendance of uh, Courtney Love and um, a Nirvana bass player, uh, Chris Novoselic, and uh, Kurt Cobain's daughter, Francis Bean Cobain. Uh, they all liked the film very much and they complimented me about the animation that we did, that they liked a lot. And personally I was very moved by the film uh, because it turned out to be a very good raw portrait of uh, Kurt Cobain. And yeah, also of course because, um, yeah, because I worked so hard for four months. I mean, it was pretty, pretty emotional. And also because I sort of uh, saw all the similarities between my own teenage years and especially in the, in the parts that we animated. So uh, I would like to end with uh, the trailer for the film. Uh, first of all, because there you can see a little bit how the animation got integrated into the film, uh, but also because I think that this trailer is uh, really a piece of art. <laughs> Are you, Kurt? I'm Kurt. 
Miracle Day. I was underdeveloped, immature little dude that never got laid. Oh, poor little kid. I don't know how anybody deals with having your whole family reject you. Kurt became really unruly. He hated being humiliated. You'd see the rage come out. You always have to do some kind of art. You go out for a few hours, you come back, and there was a painting on the wall, and he wrote a song. His goal was to write as well as he could, play as well as he could. That's all in the music, man. It was awe-inspiring, but it was like, wow, oh, you know, I guess I'm not all that special. This is what I've always wanted to do. And I said, you better buckle up, because you are not ready for this. normalcy. He wanted the mom, the dad, and the kids and everything happy. But then he didn't. If anything's going to stop me from pursuing this rock and roll thing, it's going to be her. He wanted to build a home because his home and his family fell apart. We were all he had. Mom, I felt kind of happy. Right now. He was searching for whatever made him feel like he wasn't alone. You're getting happier in general? Yeah, definitely. I'm really thankful for a lot of things. Are you getting all this? Yes. Oh, aren't we lucky? I'm Kurt Cobain. This is the look of Aberdeen. Come on, look at the camera. Look, that's my name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you.